the stage is yours. So thank you very much for the kind introduction and the possibility to talk about the CORA and the NACO study um, within this context. So indeed, the CORA study started in the mid 80s. It's a population based cohort in the region of Augsburg. And we are following more than 18,000 participants who initially were at the age range of 25 to 74. And they are half and half men and women. And with that, we contribute to the um, DigiMed initiative to improve prediction. And one of the um, findings we have is that prediction is actually changing over time and the availability or the potential of the risk, published risk and established risk scores to predict cardiovascular disease is, um, is not the same over time. And here you see for two scores, the um, uh, the associate or the um, relationship between the percent predicted to the percent observed, and uh, we see that the both for men and women the American scores are underestimating uh, or are overestimating the risk we observe in in Europe, and that this is changing over time and also over risk prediction. So for um, DigiMed, we are aiming at providing information through apps and have specifically assessed the role of the 30-year Framingham risk score. And what you see here again is that um, by adopting or calibrating the, um, uh, the scores to our European, uh, situ our Augsburg German situation, we um, we can we arrive at refitted estimates. However, again, we still underestimate um, the risk both for men and women in the lower risk categories. At the higher ends, it, it is improving. So there is still work to do. We consider really important to improve risk prediction. And so this is one, uh, one of the aims within Digimet well, one may ask, is, is genetics simply doing the trick? And um, for that, we have reassessed different genetic risk models. But before I come to the genetics, I just would like to show you that um, indeed the risk scores are actually picking up differences uh, quite well. So if you compare um, see uh, coronary heart disease cases and non-cases, you find that indeed the cases, both in the training set and in the test set, are really different with respect to their risk profiles, as here shown for diabetes or systolic blood pressure or also um, cholesterol. However, if we then uh, take different approaches for genetics, whether we select um, simply 10 SNPs, which were early published, or up to 40,000, or use the entire SNP space, it actually turns out that um, the cases and the non-cases are not so different. So the scores are, are have this normally the same dimension, and none of them are statistically significant. So there is really still work to do, and one, area where we see that we can improve prediction is using metabolites or proteomes, uh, a, a proteome marker, biomarkers, so that we can capture more of the specific individuality. And um, so within Digimit, we are updating the follow-up of a for acute myocardial infarction and stroke. We kind of um, uh, make sure that we have the complete genomic, transcriptomic, and metabolomic landscape um, in hand. And we are also very enthusiastic to add novel proteomic measurements, which are kind of jointly assessed in the various aspects of the project. And to really to, to improve the methodology, um, we um, are in parallel now um, uh, 
developing procedures to actually show how different is an individual from the predicted um, or diagnostic uh, score and do this in two ways. We, we get a summary measurement and then we reiterate to see how robust and stable these markers are. And this is work of Stefan Brandmeier and Christian Giger and will be also more discussed in detail in our next project meeting. So what we have seen is that, that this is really important ongoing work and that large data sets are needed. And one of the large data sets that with prospective data will become available in the next years will be the German national cohort, which has the objective to um, assess um, risks for disease, to look at health per disparities across Germany, to improve risk prediction for personalized prevention and to develop novel markers and tools for early detection of disease. And here you see that this is done in many diseases, but importantly also in with respect to cardiovascular disease. And this, this slide now shows you the um, distribution of the study centers, which are 18 in 16 study regions. The aim was to recruit 200,000 men and women in the age range between 20 and 69 years at baseline. And um, the idea is to follow these um, participants over the next 30 years. And the project overall is funded by the uh, Federal Ministry of for Education and Research, the participating federal states and the Helmholtz uh, um, Association. And so everybody receives a, level, a standard examination. We had planned to do in-depth examination in 40,000 people. We do um, magnet resonance imaging in 30,000 people at five sites at baseline. And we have a unique biomaterial collection um, and, a, and dedicated data infrastructure. So this is just highlighting the examination model, modules and I may draw your attention to the um, cardiovascular system assessments, which include basic things like blood pressure, heart rate as 10 seconds um, electrocardiogram, but also a 3D echocardiography, a vascular explorer, as well as a long-term electrocardiogram based on the as a, a mobile device, the Somno watch. And so, and you see that we also get a lot of a, a companion information as well. Um, to date, we have completed the baseline examination and have characterized more than 205,000 individuals and um, with 60,000 being in the and uh, being in the in-depth examination at baseline. Also, we completed more than 30,000 um, uh, individuals uh, for magnet for MRI imaging, and so we are now doing a follow-up examination. And um, this is where the corona the COVID uh, pandemic actually made a big difference for us because. We had to close study centers in March and we're only to able to reopen in July with a revised hygiene concept. And we are now continuing to examine individuals and have nearly examined 15,000 since July. So this is data emerging, what is happening in the pandemic. Uh, we used the time to during the closure to have a survey in all participants. And here I present first results of the first um, nearly 113,000 individuals which responded to an online questionnaire between uh, April and May. Um, you see that this is reflecting the age distribution of the NACO, health, uh, NA, the German national cohort. And at the time, the um, uh, COVID-19 disease was not very prevalent. So we had 0.3% of the participating recording a test positive result. Um, and many of, and a third nearly was without symptoms. 
Um, we assessed mental health at the time and found really um, a strong increase both in stress, depression scores and anxiety scores. And um, amazingly, this was mainly seen in the younger ages, both in men and women, whereas those 60 years and older seem to be less affected. Um, and another surprising result to us was that self-rated health did uh, deteriorate in some, but not in everybody. So we had also a, a substantial number who um, reported that their self um, their self rated health improved during the period. Nevertheless, having had a, a COVID test or even a positive result uh, was associated with um, a deterioration in self rated health and also, again, not so surprisingly, an increase in st stress level, a higher depressive uh, risk score, as well as more um, reporting of anxiety symptoms. So we see that this indeed is, is really, the COVID pandemic is really um, affecting um, the entire population and more the younger population than those older. Um, something which would be very important to really use the NACO to the full extent would be to make use of the biosampling and um, we would, if, if we would get all the means possible, like to genotype and sequence all the participants, we would like to um, prioritize the participants with an in the intensified program to look at deep multi-omics phenotyping and we also would like to highlight that we have my material to do cutting edge microbiome or viral research. So um, coming back to Digimit and the CORA cohort, we are currently um, starting to update the follow-up for acute myocardial infarction and stroke. And this morbidity follow-up will capture the impacts of the first and the, the second COVID-19 wave. So we will actually have as part of Digimed data, which will allow to see whether, for example, the risk for having a myocardial infarction and the um, observed versus the predicted um, risk rates are, um, are the same or whether, whether they are altered. And we would, accept, would expect based on our data that potentially the more senior participants would be less affected. However, we may see um, changes in those younger um, based to the, the, um, uh, the where the changes was, were also most prominent in the questionnaire data. And so this is really ex an exciting period of time to improve and understand what makes uh, a risk and how we can potentially gear future prevention. And with that, I would like to thank the team working with me in the Digimet uh, consortium. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Peters, for especially also for staying in the time. And thank you for this very uh, interesting talk. Uh, um, it was really interesting to see how, how uh, let's say, health develops in these difficult times and the self-esteem uh, uh, of, of the health. Uh, very interesting. I would have, before I look at the chat, uh, um, I would have the following question, which is not perhaps uh, concretely related to your talk, but at the end of the day, you are collecting a lot, a wealth of data, and somehow you have to integrate these data so that they are connected um, to each other, especially for each individual. How far are you in that aspect that you can really um, uh, make a picture or have a picture of the person you, you have in your pool and which you are analyzing, etc.? So the so we have dedicated data structure built up to support the um, the data collection phase, and um, this is really unique in a sense that, for example, all the instrument the the machine data uh, is now really transferred to a central site. So 
the echocardio the original echocardiography readings are available at the site mm -hmm. and this is kind of linked to the individual we are currently preparing a research database which um, is uh, dedicated for um, quality assured data and then but there are of course things missing because the next step is now really to use the data so for for the future funding phase which is to be started in 23 and which is now kind of being conceptualized really making connecting the dots providing infrastructure to make the data available and um, providing also the omics um, or the deep molecular phenotyping and the associated data structures something which needs to be put in place and needs to be conceptualized. One, we would be looking, for example, to the um, national data infrastructures, which are currently built up. So, for example, the German Human Genome Archive would be one starting point. But this is really an area where a lot of, where, um, where the, the, the concepts and the digital epidemiology needs to be further developed. Okay. Any further questions? Yeah, Professor Schunkert. Yeah. <clears throat> Very nice presentation. Um, you, you showed us the data on the recalibration of these international scores for the Bavarian population. Um, I mean, these scores have been developed in hundreds of thousands, if not millions of people or others on a very long term follow up. So you went through rather quickly. Uh, so, so what is the take home message? What is different uh, according to your analysis uh, over time? In other words, uh, does the decrease in risk that we see, for example, myocardial infarction, does that lead to a shift of these curves? Or do you see differences between the calibration in men and differences in women or younger and older? So, so what is the, the key message from, from this, I, I think, very interesting analysis? So the key message is that, as you describe, we see well. We see both. Well, we see this decline in in overall population-based risk, and we see also that the changes in in risk factor profiles. So less people smoke, but obesity may be slightly increasing. The interesting, and we thought we could like see that very clearly in the scores. However, the scores, the the, the lifestyle-related scores, seem to be so robust that they, when you recalibrate them, they pick to seem to pick it up. So you have less smokers and maybe they smoke a little bit less, but then their risk estimates change. So overall, we did not see the big difference as we had um, experienced them. So there is now, so the next step, um, and then, then we still have this challenge with the genetics, which I still think there is really room to have gene environment interaction or at least on the individual level a strong prediction but again it it doesn't seem to be so easy to depict that i mean you showed this very nice graph from based on the uk biobank um, data identifying certain uh, risk profiles based on genetics so i think this is a way to go to to kind of integrate this and then there is a, a new um, European score coming up, again, being, being developed uh, based on large number of cohorts and CORA is, is in the validation part. So the next step for us would be uh, within the DigiMed project to take these new scores and see whether they have really improved anything or whether we kind of jointly need to really um, get a grip around these genetic and molecular deep phenotyping to, to advance the, um, the thing, because currently this is still somewhat disappointing. The only good news is that the risk is not as high in the population as the scores say, but, um, but I think this is, so this is my take currently on these issues. 